Coming in at number 10, we have the Tic Tac. Not the breath freshener candy, I'm talking about the shape of an alien mothership here. You know? The Tic Tac shape has been reported for decades by UFO witnesses and pilots all over the world. And this video was one of the three that the Pentagon eventually have declassified in the past few couple years. The Tic Tac incident begins around November 10th, 2004, when radar operators reported seeing odd and slow moving objects flying in groups of 5 to 10 off the coast of San Diego. Commander David Fravor and the Black Aces squadron were asked by the USS Nimitz if they could aid in identifying what exactly was over their radar for the past couple weeks. The two F-18s chased this during an exercise. Yeah, imagine chasing a UFO, like Top Gun 3 reptilians. One of the pilots, Chad Underwood, got video and his displays caught some pretty crazy stuff. All the pilots who were involved said the object looked like a large white Tic Tac candy, unlike any other known aircraft. These objects have been sighted overcoming the Earth's gravity with no visible means of propulsion. They also lack any flight surfaces such as wings or lights. So what exactly is this flying candy? I don't know. And number 9, the Go Fast. This next video was the second out of the three videos that the Pentagon finally declassified. I say finally after they got leaked and then the Pentagon of course was like, oh yeah, those three videos, yeah, they're, uh, of course they're authentic. Like yeah, thanks for the heads up. The video shows a rounded object absolutely hauling ass across the water. The USS Theodore sent out some jets to see what the buzz was. The latest tech from the US can't even really get a read at first, but after some recalibrating, the fighter jet systems picks up and locks onto its target. The relief and confusion from the pilots makes this video great. They can't even believe what they're witnessing. After playing with different mods, the backseater is able to show the steady moving object in different lenses, infrared, thermal. It's the real deal. I would have just pretended to pass out as soon as we were close, you know what I mean? Just hoop, hoop, da. Number eight, gimbal. When Lou Elizondo ran the Defense Department initiative called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP, he compiled a list of logic defying capabilities most commonly associated with UAP sightings. The new term for UFOs. Yeah. He calls those traits the five observables anti gravity, sudden acceleration, hypersonic velocity, cloaking and low visibility, and transmedium travel. The third video leaked and finally declassified from the Pentagon is the gimbal video. We're taken aboard the same carrier ship, USS Theodore Roosevelt, taken also in 2015. The video shows a flying object and was shot off the screen of an operator aboard the USS Roosevelt. It moves, turns, rotates. Yeah, how much movement it isn't making is actually the scary part. So stationary, no means of propulsion, no exhaust. This thing's weird, dude. The official Navy video was taken in 2015 and filmed aboard a Navy fighter jet from the nuclear aircraft carrier, the USS Theodore Roosevelt off the eastern coast near Florida. And this thing looks like a floating spinning top, just sitting there. I'm just gonna say it, that's what I think it looks like. You know what I mean? Number seven is Stonehenge, another you should know to expect to see on this list. Now, I won't bring up things like the Easter head since we have sufficient evidence of human craft, but Stonehenge? On the table, so let's dive in. The circle of stone sits in the countryside of Salisbury and it comes from the Neolithic period, which was the final division of the Stone Age. They stand alone, a vast meadow sprawling for miles around it. Having visited Stonehenge myself, I can tell you that you have the choice of a 20 minute walk or a five minute shuttle ride. The energy is very void, as if the air is free of static and just doesn't seem to move. I'm not trying to be dramatic, but it does truly feel unearthly. These stones weigh an average of 50 tons and are over 8 feet in height. They seemingly dropped into their ring, no rhyme or reason in their placement, at least to Swiss author Eric Von Danken, who suggests that they may be a model of the solar system that doubled as an alien landing pad. How Stonehenge is assembled is unknown to us. There's no documentation, no other room no artifacts, there's genuinely nothing but these stones, some of which were somehow lifted feet upwards and placed horizontally on others. There's no way to know what it means either, but what we do know is that the stones are somehow perfectly aligned with solstices and eclipses, suggesting that the builders did know astrological charts and were able to keep an eye on the heavens, that's if they didn't come from them. Number 6 is interplanetary, but still alien to us, hieroglyphics on Mars. We've always talked about and conspired about aliens visiting us in ancient civilizations 
civilizations here on Earth, but what if they visited elsewhere? Or we have. Ooh, sorry, that's ghosts, not aliens. Anyways, the reason for that is some NASA photos were released in 2015 that were taken by the Curiosity rover. It shows what looks like some kind of writing or hieroglyphic on the rocks. A boxy two shape next to what looks like a curved Y with two other extending legs are side by side. While we can't be sure what the marks are at this point, it certainly has enthused ancient alien believers who claim that this is yet more evidence that aliens and ancient peoples visited one another. But skeptics argue the so called discoveries on the images sent back by the rover are just textures in the rock. Despite the temptation of reading into evidence found so far, scientists' understanding of Martian history is still unfolding. Questions up for debate are Was the ancient Martian atmosphere thick enough to keep the planet warm and wet for the time necessary to nurture life? Are organic compounds found as signs of life or simple chemistry that occurs when Martian rock interacts with our sun and water? What's your take? Hieroglyphics and conspiracy, or do you think they're just some cracked rocks? Number five, Lord Nefertiru. For this next piece of evidence, we'll be directing our focus to the land down under. Australian aliens, baby, let's do it. In the Brisbane Water National Park, to be specific. Egyptian hieroglyphs educate us on our past. There's still so much we don't know, but it's fun to find UFO looking objects within them. It's fun to speculate as we are right now. But when Egyptian texts appear around the world in the middle of nowhere, those UFO hieroglyphs get a bit more concerning. Like the Gosford glyphs, for example. Discovered in the 1970s at Karyong, there's around 300 engravings spread over two sandstone walls. The hieroglyphs are strikingly similar to that of Egypt. There's birds, even the markings of a scarab, which are those Milky Way poop pushers that I just talked about earlier. Egyptologist Raymond Johnson believes that this is the burial site of Egyptian royal family member Lord Nefertiru, who met his fate around 2600 BC, with some panels telling the story of two prince brothers who came from Egypt and subsequently became shipwrecked. But other panels get into the extraterrestrial goodness. Some of these Gosford glyphs have UFO shapes, with scarabs, birds, and sun symbols popping up as well. Maybe we did have alien aid when it came to laying these royal family members to rest. Number four, Userkaf. Remember earlier when I was talking about those extremely heavy granite coffins? Well, the Sun Temple in Egypt may give us more alien clues as to their purpose. Discovered in 1842, this was the base of a giant monument that apparently used to stand over 150 feet tall. Built by the pharaoh Yuzakaf, founder of the 5th dynasty of Egypt, the temple translates to Stronghold of Ra. Ra being the sun god. This temple at Abu Ghraib was home to one of the world's largest monoliths, and its purpose may blow your mind. This obelisk was built out of granite. Now they made things out of granite back then because it contained quartz. Quartz, due to piezoelectricity, was able to convert the Earth's vibrations into energy. Nikola Tesla did something similar. He figured out standing waves, which was the ability to pass energy through the air. Perhaps these granite monoliths were used to teleport people or goods. That would explain the last point about those Australian glyphs. To be fair, I have zero idea how Bluetooth works either. Alien airdropped in Egypt. I'm here for this theory. Number three, Khufu. In order to become a god in the afterlife, these kings would build massive temples or pyramids. The Giza pyramids were built over 4,500 years ago, and to this day, they draw in about 15 million visitors a year. Pharaoh Khufu's is the largest pyramid in Giza, and it was the first pyramid that they started to build, obviously taking the longest. Reaching up to 147 meters high, it took 2.3 million rocks to create this landmark, and its alignment with Orion's belt gives it an extraterrestrial vibe, and with Tesla CEO Elon Musk tweeting aliens built the pyramids, obvi, we now have to ask just how did thousands of workers achieve this? The placement of the pyramid is also unique as well. It's aligned perfectly with the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. That much accuracy back then with the stars and the earth and the heavens, they must have gotten help from alien friends or else they had the world's biggest protractor. Number two, King Tut. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with said king. It's not uncommon to be buried with your goods. It's why Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so that grave robbers wouldn't snoop around and steal your entire family heritage. It was made so nothing could get out, which is insane. But two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other gold. Now with iron being even more rare than gold in the Bronze Age, this was a big deal. And with recent advancements in technology, we were able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometry, and according to the journal Meteorites in the Planetary Science, the blade Blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that this material is of extraterrestrial origin. And finally, number one, the Great Pyramid of Cholula. There are many parallels between Egyptian and Maya civilizations. The two cultures are so far apart, both in time and distance, and they also never made contact. But both pyramids are made with steps, and both have stone serpents. 
The vault arches are also strikingly similar, and hieroglyphs within share a lot of the same symbolism. These hieroglyphs include advanced mathematics that they say was bestowed upon them, also from these sky gods. Was this just one landing site of our alien ancestors? Let us know in the comments below all your thoughts. Guys, thank you so much for joining us on today's video. Those were just 10 Egyptian pharaohs that have ties to extraterrestrials and maybe aliens, but which other civilizations do you think made contact? Do you think aliens are still hiding here today? Is Rachel an alien? We don't know. Let us know in the comments below. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have organic material. Just this morning, we received received a huge announcement from NASA. Of course, many of us are at least in some way familiar with the Perseverance rover that is currently on Mars digging around in the soil. And recently, this rover has been searching at the site of an ancient river delta, trying to find any clues that might give us insight into the past lives of the planet. Well, that sweet little rover has made its most important discovery to date. A few recently collected samples have been confirmed to include organic matter. This means that the Jezero crater, which likely was once the home to a lake that the delta emptied into, well, it would have potentially had a habitable environment about three and a half billion years ago. These organic molecules are supremely important because they represent the building blocks of life, like carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And while this discovery doesn't just flat out confirm the past existence of life on the planet, it is one of the strongest clues we've ever received, which is absolutely unbelievable. In our number nine spot today, we have the mysterious beam. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit that thumbs up button if you're enjoying this video so far. It does really help us out. Pretty recently, scientists explained that they captured a mysterious beam of energy that was coming from the star that is the closest known star to the sun, Proxima Centauri. This star is small and low mass and is located about 4.2 light years away from us. The thing about this star is that it has one rocky exoplanet that is 17% larger than Earth in its half habitable zone, which would make liquid water a possibility on the planet. This planet's habitability has been disputed throughout the years, but this signal could be a sign that it may be even more habitable than any of us know. Scientists explained that the signal shifted while it was being observed, which mimicked the shift caused by the movement of a planet. They're taking extra precautions to figure out what exactly caused this shift in case it was some sort of a mundane source, but it will of course take some time to figure out, but it's all very exciting. In our number eight spot today, we have Europa. One of Jupiter's moons called Europa has a red tinge to it and in 2001 NASA scientists revealed that it's possible that alien microbes might be responsible for this red color. The surface of this moon is mostly ice but it has been shown that it reflects infrared radiation in a really bizarre way. This means that something is binding it together but researchers haven't been able to come up with the correct combination of elements and compounds to make the data that they have make sense. There are some bacteria on Earth that can thrive in extreme conditions and that also have that red and brown color which could potentially be responsible for the color on this moon. The surface temperature might be too cold for them to survive, but the warmer interior might be where they are located. Some geological activity on the moon could then push them closer to the surface where they are then flash frozen in place. Number seven, dozer. For this one, we're looking into some bull worshiping. So grab your red scarves and start waving them around. Just north of the Steppe Pyramid of the Pharaoh Doser, archaeologist August Marionette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium is a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. Now, this was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls. They were basically these bulls that were said to be sacred, and after their death, they would become immortal. Remember that, that's important. Today at Saqqara, there's this massive vault. It's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock. It's massive, and along the sides of them are 24 chambers, each with sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Now, inside these boxes were animal remains, just bones and all. But back then, in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. That was a no-go. You had to mummify them. So how are these tombs built, first of all, so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and where do these bones come from? Perhaps these are the remains of the Apis bull. After all, that's the inspiration for the Minotaurs, so maybe alien ancestors looked a lot more jacked than we may think. Number six, dung beetles. This one isn't exactly a pharaoh at all, but it's too good to leave out, especially if we're talking about aliens here. It's important. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way. Think about that for a second. That is... Let's talk about it. Some animals follow the sun. You know, turtles sprint to the ocean the second they're born to avoid getting plucked up by birds. Now these insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their 
towards it. Literally, they're, they're poop. They would roll it towards the skies, which is insane. Symbols of these beetles are seen all over, either in hieroglyphics or even in movies, their presence is known. Near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, there is a massive scarab monument. And there's even a legend still to this day behind said statue that if you walk around it nine times, you would find health, wealth, and love. And you'd also probably be a little bit dizzy. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which at the time Egyptians believed was the sun as well. Also known as a scarab face god, which terrifying when you imagine that. Are these bugs just trying to get home into space to their bug alien master? Why does he need so much poop? Whatever DIY project they're working on in the Milky Way probably doesn't smell too good. In our number five spot today, we have Enceladus. Enceladus used to be thought of as basically just an icy snowball floating around in space, or as a small moon of Saturn with a diameter of 502 kilometers, but as it turns out, this small moon might hold some pretty amazing potential. It was discovered that this moon has hydrothermal processes going on underneath its crust. To us non-scientists, that means almost next to nothing, but what if I said that that means that it just might have all of the requirements for life, and that it is becoming a greater possibility that we might find microbial life there. Basically, this moon has an icy shell for a surface and then a rocky interior, but between these two layers is a warm ocean, and this ocean is where scientists think life is most likely to be. This discovery came almost accidentally when the Cassini orbiter arrived to Saturn in 2005, and it found water plumes shooting out of the cracks in the surface of this moon, which made scientists realize that it just may be geologically active. Through more research and by flying the orbiter through the water, by the time 2015 rolled around, scientists knew that it was holding all of the keys to life. While this little moon was never the original focus of research, it quickly took over with its incredibly exciting potential. In our number four spot today, we have shifts. In the latter half of 2015, a Penn State astronomer named Jason Wright explained that there were pretty erratic and spontaneous shifts in light that was coming from a newly discovered star. The star sits about 1,280 light years away from us on Earth, and these shifts were very similar to as if something was passing in front of our view of the star briefly before passing through. Scientists weren't able to connect this to any exoplanets or anything like that, which we could understand, and this is what led Jason to quite an interesting theory. He stated that it is possible that the shifts are caused by massive objects passing in front of the star in a kind of orbit, like an array of massive satellites or a similar kind of structure, like the type of thing that would be produced by an intelligent and civilized life form. Again, like many things, it's just a theory, but a very compelling one at that. In our number three spot today, we have the UFO footage. Remember during the pandemic when there was that footage from the Navy that went viral where it captured some kind of UFO, but we didn't really have the time to free out because we were all just like watching Tiger King and wondering what the hell was going on and when we could go outside again? Well, let's freak out about it now because what the heck was captured on those videos? The US Navy released footage a few years ago where they had captured video of some sort of wingless aircraft that was traveling at hypersonic speeds. Of course, people are wary to believe that this is a true sign of alien life and alien visitors, but the thing is, we simply just don't really know what it is. We know it's not something that is known to us yet, so this definitely could be a sign of some sort of alien life. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But hey, if the Navy's worried, so am I. Number two, Spain. This next one, yeah, I, I don't know if it's real or not. I thought the Scorpion King with the rock was real. Yeah, the latest CGI, you know? So who knows, but I can't stop watching it. The video allegedly shows a UFO filmed by a fisherman near Galicia, Spain. The craft hovers over the ocean before splashing into the waters as military jets fly overhead. We see two fighter jets whiz by this fishing ship, apparently following this craft. There isn't any official info surrounding this video, I just felt like it's pretty modern and shows some F-18s and the speeds that they fly at, you know? The fishermen film a 42 second video showing what I guess would be the Spanish military chasing a UFO accompanied by an unmarked blacked out chopper before slamming down into the water. If we use Elizondo's five observables and apply them to this video, we see low visibility, hypersonic speeds, and transmedium travel. The more I watch, it's gotta be fake, but after listening to all the fighter pilots talk about chasing these things literally into the water, it's got me thinking. I don't know, what do you think? And number one, the Aguadilla Airport. This is probably my favorite UFO video. The longest, 
clearest and most puzzling. The incident took place in 2013 in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. Scientists who've analyzed thermal images of a flying object recorded in Puerto Rico are still trying to figure out what could have done this. A team of analysts working with the SCU, which is the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, a private group of scientists, military analysts, and investigators, produced a report analyzing this incident. It's a comprehensive stew of thermal, visual, and sensor data related to an unusual series of events in and around the Aguadilla, Puerto Rican airport. Yeah, they were experiencing a couple weeks of these things. This thing's just trucking steadily, splits into two, turns directions. Safe to say this video does a great job of showing Lou's five observables. What do you think? Are these crafts being piloted by the way, or are they being remote controlled? Either or, that's absolutely terrifying. Number 10 is the pyramids of Chichen Itza. These ancient Mayan pyramids are obvious ones to end up on our list. This ancient structure has long since been connected to aliens. Many believe that they help build the structure, but also use them as markers for landing space vessels. There's of course a theory as well though that the top of the pyramid has emitted a powerful energy beam, enabling the ancient Mayans to communicate with aliens or other pyramids around the world, implying the potential of interconnectedness between multiple pyramids and civilizations that we'll talk about through this video. Number 9 is the Vastu architecture. These temples in India contain intriguing alien like depictions carved on their stone walls. People flying, alien esque figures, strange flying devices, the whole alien shebang. So, one theory for this is that aliens visited ancient Indians and these interactions are depicted on their stonework now as a result. And to tack onto that, some believe that when these aliens shared their flying technology, the Indian people began to worship them as their gods. Naturally, we circle back to the concept of pyramids and grand temples being built to having the ability to harness energy from above to communicate with aliens or other civilizations as well. But it's been said that these temples were constructed with specific design given an old Hindu text known as Vastu Shastra, and the texts give intensely specific considerations to astronomy in its design, basing it off of all the movements of the stars and planets. So maybe a space laser being emitted from the temple isn't too far. Off. The gods, architectural methods, and advanced technology may not confirm the existence of aliens coming to Indian land, but at least can raise some suspicion. Anyways, the temples show a similarities to the depiction of an ancient Indian flying machine called Vin Amas, which will be number 8 on the countdown. Scripts from over 2,000 years ago in India claim dozens of accounts of people seeing these flying machines. They're described differently in some accounts, man-made wings like a plane, a disc shape, and a famous cloud palace depiction. The Sanskrit word Vin Manana, when translated, literally means measuring out, traversing. In short, it means some form of aircraft. When eight chapters of this ancient document are translated from Sanskrit, they revealed an intriguing list of these features that the devices had, such as remote images on screens, remote sounds. To protect itself, it had the ability to disguise itself as a cloud or create terrifying sounds. The discussion on Vin Manana includes various constructions to double as boats or even submarines. There's discourse on astrophoric pressure, aeronautic hazards, and even dietary and clothing for aviators. These writings were no manifestations or metaphors. They talked about how the gods rode them, but anyone may ride and own one as well. They were treated as manufactured physical objects or even flying houses. For this much ancient text to be translated and have so much modern ideology and inventions, well, it must be aliens or perhaps some ancient sci-fi stories or perhaps now we see these objects with hindsight and try to fit them into something that makes more sense to to us now, such as an airplane, but they're just anything but, and we'll never know. Swarm splash. We now have two videos taken from military personnel from apparently the same incident. Isn't that interesting? Makes it realer and realer, doesn't it? The radar footage released by Jeremy Corbell shows multiple objects popping up and around the Navy's USS Omaha from an incident in July 2019. The ship was about 125 miles off the coast of San Diego when the footage was recorded. Radar shows the USS Omaha absolutely being swarmed by 14 UFOs. In the same incident, that a spherical aircraft was filmed disappearing into the Pacific Ocean. Okay, this is getting scary now. Same ship, two vids, same time. The radar shows the blips hovering around the ship, not really doing anything. Also, imagine 14 unidentified aircrafts above a US warship. It would be game over, like boom, 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 dude, out of the sky. But instead, we're just left with the videos, scratching our heads, in awe. Then the thing splashes into the water, showing transmedium travel. You can hear the operator say mark bearing and range, so they were clocking these things. This has unlocked a new fear of mine. Yeah, water. Jaws has nothing on me now. Number six, 
Pyramids. The video and photos of this next encounter were originally shared at the Office of Naval Intelligence briefing on May 1st, 2020 and later leaked to Jeremy Corbell, filmmaker and UFOlogist. For those of you who don't know Jeremy, like he's like our guy. He's pushing the boundaries, he's putting pressure on officials, he's a filmmaker and an avid UFOer like me. And he's got his hands in some pretty, pretty deep pockets. I'm just as puzzled with this video as you are. Green pyramids? Pulsing? The leaked video of flashing triangle shaped objects that flew over a US warship is the real deal, the Pentagon said. After UFO investigators released the video and other puzzling photos online, shot through night vision from the ship itself, the Pentagon confirmed in a statement that the leaked photos and videos were captured by official US Navy. <sighs> Though it's declined to label them as UAPs. Ah. Quote, I can confirm that the referenced photos and videos were taken by Navy personnel, Pentagon spokesperson Susan Gao said in a statement. Okay, so they're real, but what are they? Is this what the Egyptians base theirs off of? I don't know, what do you think? Up next is the City of the Gods number 5. Teotihuacan is its actual name. This sprawling ancient city in Mexico is known best for its astronomically aligned buildings and complex pyramid temples. Their building was dated back 2000 years and scientists have suspected a mixture of cultures including Mayan, Zapotec and Mixtec built the city so that they could house more than 100,000 people. They adorned it with murals and they had a transportation system. Evidence shows advanced agricultural practices that earned the city a reputation of being much more technologically developed than should be possible in pre-Aztec Mexico. So naturally that brings us to the ideology of aliens, especially as the most massive temple, the Pyramid of the Sun, which is one of the largest constructions in the western hemisphere. It's also been noted that the alignment of the pyramids is based on calendar cycles. Many people believe that the flat top pyramid served as a landing pad where the alien secrets lay inside the impenetrable walls. In 2003 though, a sinkhole caused by a flood led to the discovery of the Avenue of the Dead Tunnel, connecting the Sun Temple with the Temple of the Plumed Serpent. People believe that this connection correlates with rituals and contacts shared between civilizations and aliens, these tunnels being used to transport sacrifice or make passage between the communication stations easier. Its name was given to it by the Aztecs when its deserted ruins were discovered sometime in the 1300s. It had already been abandoned for centuries at this point. When the names translated, it means the place where men become gods, and why they chose to name it that, we're unsure. When the Aztecs found it, there was likely a great amount of discernible history available in contrast to today's standards. Perhaps they saw writings and stories that we didn't, something to make them believe in godly powers of the temples or the peoples. We know frustratingly little about this mysterious society from the conditions of its rise to the circumstances of its collapse to its actual name. The Delphi site of Greece is number 4. Alien theorists love to use Greeks as a basis for their theories. This is because of the possibility of life beyond earth is one that began in ancient Greece world, originating at least as far far back as the 4th century BC when ancient Greek society had schools of thought that speculated extraterrestrial life. One of the favorite examples is Delphi, Greece, where the stone masonry is eerily similar to that of Saxe Humana in Peru, which is believed to be a site of alien intervention. This was also the famous site of the Oracle of Delphi, a prophetic woman who would reside in the temple of Parmasus. She was rumored to have sat on a golden tripod over a fissure in limestone where she could breathe in the breath of Apollo and communicate with invisible forces. What she was breathing in, we aren't sure. According to toxologist Henry Spiller, both of the ways an oracle's vision would occur, either peaceful and slow or erratic and barely legible, are symptoms associated with inhalation of hydrocarbon gases, aka she could have just been zooted. But with the architecture as a star, alienologists jump to say that this perhaps too could have truly been alien communication. The oracle was said to be possessed by Apollo and in order to be asked prophetic questions about upcoming war, political actions, theories of life and more, what if it wasn't Apollo, but rather she was channeling alien messages through an unconscious state that the fissure had been a beam of alien power going into her. Maybe that explains why Delphi, Greece is considered one of the three major UFO sighting hotbeds in Greece. In fact, on June 3rd of 2012, this picture was taken and posted on a UFO forum claiming the image to contain a UFO. What do you think, faux or fact? It's Corral Soup at number 3. And despite its significance now, the importance of this site wasn't determined until decades after its discovery. Hilariously, this is because of the sheer size and complexity 
complexity of it deceived scholars, and many believe that the site was more recent, so they left it largely ignored. It's in 1994, Ruth Shady was studying the site, she realized the lack of pottery wasn't because of the recency, the site was just dated before the advent of pot firing technology. Radiocarbon dating on some of the woven bags found inside the pyramid confirmed that Coral Soup were the locus of some of the earliest population concentrations and corporate architecture in South America, dating somewhere around 2600 BC, which upended history's well established timeline, pushing it back 4600 or more years. Now, since then, other Notre Chico sites have been found that date several hundred years earlier, but at the same time, Corral Soup was being built, so was the ziggurats in Mesopotamia and the steppe pyramids of Egypt, all incredibly similar structures. Ancient astronaut theorists believe that they could be profoundly connected, especially following the theory of ancient buildings such as these that tend to average around the 4500 age range. Number two. Lost in space. During the 60s, the space race was on between the Americans and the Russians. Like a good old hockey game, huh? Those two, always at it. The first to figure it out what it is to put something or someone up in a little metal box. It was actually the Soviets that secured many of the early victories. While NASA's efforts were widely publicized, of course, sometimes the Soviets made it a point to never announce a mission until days after it was completed. And of course, successful. This allowed them to maintain control over information. Enter stage right, the Giudica Cordiglia brothers from Italy. Former amateur radio operators who apparently caught Russian audio recordings which allegedly proves the Soviets covered up cosmonauts failed missions in the early 1960s. Apparently she's saying, help, help, I feel hot, am I going to crash? Uh, yo, that is absolutely horrifying. If this is the real deal and the Soviets sent a woman into space that maybe didn't come back, this proves that whatever happens in space stays in space. We're only told what we're supposed to hear. Number one, Buzz Aldrin, American astronaut, engineer, fighter pilot with a doctor of science in astronautics. This guy is overqualified. Three spacewalks in 1966, Gemini 12 mission, as the lunar module Eagle pilot on the 1969 Apollo 11 mission, he and mission commander Neil Armstrong were the first two to land on the moon. There was something out there, close enough to be observed and what it could be, according to Aldrin on Apollo 11 to the moon, he observed a light out of the window that appeared to be moving alongside them. But what could it have been other than another spacecraft from another country or maybe even another world. It was either the rocket that had separated from us or the four panels that moved away when we extracted the lander. After he returned home from his missions, he was convinced that he saw aliens while he was out there. Credentials aside, Guy took a lie detector test, which he passed with flying colors. In an interview with C-SPAN, Buzz talked about the future potential of the Earth's moon for humanity. He added a little extra info that might have ignited the spark to go back regarding a certain monolith on the moon. Quote, visit the moon Phobos of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato object that goes around the moon once every seven hours. When people find out about that, they're gonna say, who put that there? Yeah, I'll be the first one, Buzz. Who did put that there? Kicking off the list at number 10, KB-55. Located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB-55, was found by Edward Arden back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason we call this tomb by a number rather than name is because we really don't know who was inside it yet. Even the walls outside of the tomb, they aren't covered with any hieroglyphs to tip us off or give us any hints. It's just bare which is kind of eerie. As you walk down the 20 steps towards KV-55, you'll notice markings on the entrance. Markings that show that the entrance was widened since it was first cut, along with its ceilings being raised higher. So whatever was in there needed the room. The only hint as to who was buried remains on the walls. One hieroglyph remains and it was discovered in 1907 and it translates to the evil one that shall not live again. Even these massive stones were built in order to prevent anything from getting out. See, usually with these ancient tombs, it's the opposite. The description for who's inside the tomb had also been destroyed. So we have no idea who or what is in KB 55. Number nine, King Teti. The Pyramid of Teti was built for the first ruler of the 6th dynasty, and while it's not flashy or massive as these other pyramids, the insides contain the oldest writing in the religious world. Pretty insane. Now these texts go back to 2400 BC, way back when we used, you know, BBM. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this King Teddy could ascend to the heavens after his death. There are spells and incantations meant to free the king's soul and arrive in the cosmos. More specifically, for Teddy to become a star in the sky and then join Osiris and Orion in the God Squad. 
There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to said heavens. World's oldest instruction manual for the win. Number eight, Queen Nefertiti. After a scan was done on King Tut's tomb, there were cracks found on the north and earth walls. East, Taylor, east, not earth. There were cracks found on the north and east side walls. So we believe that this is a secret passageway to Queen Nefertiti, the ruler during the 14th century BC, and also wife to King Tut. Queen Nefertiti's parents are also still unknown to this day, so that adds to it. And with ancient texts depicting that these kings and queens would leave Earth and then later return, perhaps they are both descendants of extraterrestrials. And this flying sun disk that they worshipped was not the sun, but rather a winged alien ancestor. In our number seven spot today, we have cyanobacteria. For around two decades, Dr. Richard Hoover has been studying meteorites that were found in Antarctica, and in 2011, he claimed that he and his team had found evidence of ancient bacteria from colonies that thrived on comets, moons, and other planets. The astrobiologist said they were able to make this discovery through the use of the most advanced micro scanning technology in the entire world. Dr. Hoover sliced open these meteorites and discovered what they call the remains of cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae. This type of algae is said to have a unique quality and the ability to thrive even in some of the harshest conditions, which is necessary when talking about surviving the extreme environment that some other planets hold, as well as just space in general. Dr. Hoover said that while some of the bacteria he had found was similar to those on Earth, he also said that some of the others were completely alien. He said, quote, neither I nor other experts who have seen the evidence have any idea what these creatures might be. I believe these findings indicate that life is not restricted to Earth, but is broadly distributed even outside our solar system. In our number six spot today, we have the radiation proof bacteria. In 2002, Russian astrobiologists hypothesized that a bacteria here on Earth may have actually evolved on Mars. Dionychus radioranus is the most tough bacteria here on Earth. It can withstand even the most extreme conditions such as cold, dehydration, vacuum, and acid. But the craziest part is that it is virtually radiation proof. These little microbes can withstand several thousand times the amount of radiation a human can withstand, as well as more radiation than any other bacteria on Earth. You can even find this bacteria on the inside of a nuclear reactor. That's how radiation proof it is. Scientists did an experiment to see how quickly this bacteria could build up a stronger radiation resistance by zapping it with enough radiation to kill 99.9% .9 of it, and then leaving the remaining 0.0% to repopulate before zapping it again and just repeating the process. It was concluded that it would have taken E. coli thousands and thousands of rounds to build up the same resistance that this hardy bacteria did in only 44 rounds. With this experiment and based on the dose of radiation they gave each bacteria, it would take millions and millions of years to get even close to the amount of radiation they gave this bacteria in one cycle. Since Earth just doesn't carry that amount of radiation, it has led some scientists to speculate that since Mars is virtually now unprotected and receives extremely high amounts of radiation, these bacteria may have evolved on Mars and gained their resistance in just a few hundred thousand years, and then they may have been flung off Mars by an asteroid and then brought to Earth on meteorites. Number 5. Congress May 17th of this year was the first United States official Congress hearing in the last 50 years. Monumental. From Blue Book to UAPs, they tried to make this hearing look as dated and as boring as they could, but there were two videos shown at the hearing. One, a USO, unidentified submerged object, shown only to officials at a closed room conference after the hearing. And this one, the 2.3 seconds of something shiny just whizzing by a ship. Apparently they said it was a deflated balloon. I'm surprised it's not swamp gas way up there. See, this is the government we know and love. Leaking and sharing, one terrible video out of 140 cases between 2004 and 2021, and this is it? This is barely anything. Lawmakers were shown declassified images and footage of UFOs. I'd love to see their faces before and after the briefing. You know, they just walk in, <laughs> walk out. Number four, Mexico. On March 5th, 2004, a Mexican Air Force flight crew filmed 11 unidentified flying objects in the skies over southern state of Campeche. But the public was not notified of the sightings until Mexico's Defense Department issued a statement on May 12th, days later. Of course, 
I get it, you gotta come up with an excuse, we get it. A press release was accompanied by a videotape that showed some bright objects resembling orbs of light moving quickly on an evening cloudy sky. The lights were actually extreme heat sources filmed by the crew using infrared technology during a surveillance mission in search of drug smuggling planes. They were reportedly flying at an altitude of about 11,000 feet. The Mexican Air Force has released footage of what a UFO expert said were two, then 11 objects picked up as they whizzed around the clouds, sometimes disappearing totally. I just saw Jordan Peele's nope, and the clouds thing is really messing with me. Yeah, spoiler alert, sorry. Number three, Chile. Experts still can't explain this next video captured from a Navy helicopter. After two years of study, Chilean authorities have declassified and released a nine minute video of a UFO. On the afternoon of November 14th, 2014, a Chilean Navy pilot and a technician were flying a helicopter along the coast when they saw something fishy. They were going north in a twin engine Airbus Cougar when something appeared in the sky and matched their velocity of 130 knots. The helicopter's technician was testing the thermal imaging properties of the infrared FLIR high definition camera. After minutes, the pilot and technician observed the object make two distinct discharges of some type, liquid or gas, which produced a red hot signature captured by the infrared imager. The Navy turned the video over to the Committee for the Study of Anomalous Aerial Phenomenon known as CEFA. This is the Chilean government group that investigates UFO sightings. I guess the sixth observable is if you see a UFO fart, cause yeah, that's clearly a fart. You know? In our number two spot today, we have the bacterial experiment. On Earth, most living creatures require oxygen to live, but the problem with a lot of planets is that there's far more hydrogen and helium. Last year, scientists decided to take two different bacteria. One was E. coli, which can be found in the guts of humans and ordinary yeast, which is used in things like bread and beer. With these two bacteria, they tried to see if they could live in different environments. When placed within flasks that contained either pure hydrogen or pure helium, they still managed to grow, just at a slower pace. This evidence goes to show that there might be living organisms that we haven't found yet because we are looking in the wrong places. In our number one spot today, we have the Venus cloud. Last year in September of 2020, astrobiologists everywhere were excited and skeptical of some new potential evidence that had been found in the upper clouds of Venus. Firstly, can we just take a second to really think about how cool of a job an astrobiologist has? Anyway, the new findings were pointing to the potential of the presence of phosphine in these clouds. Phosphine is rare and usually a poisonous gas that on Earth is basically always met with the presence of living organisms. Venus hasn't really been the top of the list of choices for finding potential life due to its surface temperature and pressure in the sulfuric acid clouds, but this evidence could prove to say something otherwise. Two separate telescopes were able to pick up the signatures of phosphine in a cloud that had a similar temperature and pressure to Earth, and while this isn't concrete evidence of space bugs, it will at least be a reminder that we should continue looking for life even in the most unlikely places. And hey, maybe it is space bugs. Number 10, Al Warden. American test pilot, engineer, and NASA astronaut Alfred Merrill Warden, the pilot for the Apollo 15 lunar missions in 1971. One of the 24 people that have gone to the moon. Woohoo! He orbited it 74 times. Well, he was the first to even drive a moon car. Warden remained at NASA until 1975, and then it gets a little weird. Recently, on a morning show, they asked Warden, why do we keep going back to the moon? He paused and said, quote, survival. Survival of our species. When pressed on aliens, he said, you know, we are the aliens, right? We just think there's somebody else. We're the ones who came from somewhere else because somebody else had to survive. They got in a little spacecraft and they came here and they landed and they started civilization here. And if you don't believe me, go get books on the ancient Sumerians and see what they have to say about it." End quote. <laughs> yeah, that's not uh, terrifying at all, Al. Number nine, Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Dean Mitchell was a US Navy officer, aviator, test pilot, engineer, NASA astronaut, and of course, ufologist. Ufology is the pseudo term for somebody who studies UFOs. I don't think there's like a degree you can just get that in. If so, where? I'm signing up. Just needed a name for it, I guess? I don't know. The lunar module pilot of Apollo 14 in 1971, guy clocked nine hours working on the moon. He was the sixth person to walk on the moon as well. Mitchell publicly expressed his opinions that he was sure that there were thousands of UFOs recorded since the early 1940s, apparently belonging to other planets. Thousands of them. 
NBC conducted an interview in 1996. He talked about meeting with officials from three different countries who said that they had met ETs in person. Quote, the evidence for alien contact is very strong and classified by governments who are covering up visitations and the existence of alien bodies, specifically in places like Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, sorry, do you mind if I just see his credentials one more time? Thank you so much. Number eight. James McDivitt. James Alton McDivitt is an American test pilot, Air Force pilot, engineer, and NASA astronaut who flew both in the Gemini and Apollo programs. McDivitt was selected by NASA for the Gemini 4 mission, and in 1965, he saw, filmed, and photographed an object, which approached the Gemini 4 as they were orbiting Earth over Hawaii. Apparently, the UFO had a long arm sticking out of it. Quote, I was flying with Ed, he was sleeping, we were drifting, when suddenly an object appeared in the window. A cylindrical object, white. The film was then sent back to NASA and reviewed by NASA film technicians in 1975. It looked like a white beer can with a pencil sticking out of it. Yeah, he tried for years to get the word out about the phenomenon, but NASA lost those pictures apparently. Oh, that James, he's a, he's a crazy one up there in space with all those degrees he has. What a wacko. Number seven. Dark Side of the Moon. Not just an absolute banger of an album, also one of the most terrifying mysterious places in our galaxy. The dark side of our moon. Since the 1950s, NASA has seen and heard some pretty weird stuff back there. See, once you sign that non-disclosure, they kinda own ya, you know? Despite what you may have heard, it's true that the Apollo 10 astronauts did hear some interesting sounds behind the moon. Described as outer space type music. Audio recordings from the Apollo 10 mission Astronaut Gene Kernan asks John Young if he hears that. Gene calls it music and says it even sounds outer spacey sounding. Young says, we're gonna have to find out about that because nobody's gonna believe us. Hey man, no one believes anyone who's gone up there so don't take it personally. Astronauts go through visual and audio testing like the Navy SEALs. They know what they're doing. If they say Angel by Shaggy is playing back there, I'm believing them. Number six, Leland Melvin. American engineer and NASA astronaut on board the space shuttle Atlantis, selected by NASA in 1998. This guy's put in time with mission after mission. Melvin has over 565 hours in space. Quite the practice at the whole floating around thing, I'd say. When Leland then was pressed about otherworldly visitors, he said, he had seen something translucent, curved, and organic looking when he was working with fellow astronaut Randy Bresnik. The pair called the ground to ask NASA what it could be, and NASA's response was, eh, probably ice, probably ice. Nice and scientific, Houston. Thanks for that. Mr. Melvin dismissed this and figured it was just NASA's explanation to cover it up. Like, who's more qualified here? That's all I'm asking. When the most qualified people are like, yeah, I can't tell if that's frozen water or a spaceship. Either they shouldn't be up there at all, or they need some more Windex on those windows, NASA. Number five, Ivan Wagner. Astronaut Ivan Wagner was on the ISS as a first timer in 2020. You think they like do trades initiations to the rookies up there? Like no gravity and buckle you when you sleep? Ah. What do you think? He and fellow Russian Anatoly Ivishnin are working with Chris Cassidy up there, the American commander of said expedition. Wagner was then orbiting the Earth and might have actually captured footage of UFOs, better known now as UAPs. The aurora lights behind Earth's beautiful curves was being recorded and it was seen he labeled the video Space Guests. Wagner then tweeted the vid, the aurora australis near Antarctica and Australia, and then this blob of organized lights shows up. Of course, NASA didn't follow up. Like, what are they gonna say? Uh, yeah, that, that's a swamp gas, birds, balloon, grass, cars, something up there, I don't know. Cut the feed, cut the feed. Number four, moonwalk. Yeah, so apparently the footage our parents and also 650 million people across the globe watched in 1969 was not the original footage. Hold up, hold up, what? Yeah, apparently what everyone saw on every television set across the globe wasn't as 4K as NASA's end. A man by the name of Gary George came across some very, very old tapes that might be proof as to what NASA sees and what they hear on their end. It's a little different than what we see. Gary George bought 218 surplus government tapes, three reels labeled Apollo 11 EVA. He auctioned them at Sotheby's, first generation of the moonwalk. So hold on. NASA just had a clear copy of this the whole time? I get it, maybe they had a bigger budget. I'm thinking so we can't see what's in the background. 
or what's flying in the background, or any stars in the background. Yeah, I just wonder how long it's gonna take before Robert Bigelow or Tom DeLonge get their hands on that. Hey mom, there's something in the background, guys. Pay attention. Number three, Gordon Cooper. Leroy Gordon Cooper Jr. was an American engineer, test pilot, US Air Force pilot, and the youngest of the seven original astronauts in Project Mercury. You know the pictures, it's the old school tinfoil suits. 1963, Cooper piloted the longest and last Mercury space flight, Mercury Atlas 9. 34 hours in space. The first American to spend an entire day in space, the first to sleep in space, and in Cooper's autobiography, Leap of Faith, he recounted his relationship with the Air Force and NASA and their relationship to the UFO conspiracy. Cooper claimed to see his first UFO while flying over Germany. He said that there were hundreds of reports made by pilots, many coming from military on radar. In 1978, he even testified before the United Nations on the topic. Radar operators, fighter pilots, fellow astronauts. He was a strong advocate for disclosure up until his passing. But the largest mystery of Corral Soup remains why it was abandoned so suddenly after thousands of years of inhabitation. There's no concrete evidence indicating a single event like an earthquake or large flood that ended this occupation. Number two is the Nazca Lines. These are a little more famous, so you may be familiar. They lay 320 kilometers southeast of Lima and they cover a total length of 1,300 kilometers of high and dry plateau. They are seemingly at random. Joining them are 300 geometric shapes and 70 figures of animals, including a spider, a monkey, a hummingbird, and a bizarre alien man figure. The biggest shapes stretch nearly 1,200 feet across and are best viewed from the air. Scientists suspect that the Nazca drawings are as many as two millennia old, and because of their age, size, and visibility from above, and mysterious nature, the lines are often cited as one of the best examples of alien handiwork on Earth. I mean, how would an ancient culture have been able to make such huge designs? in the desert without being able to fly. And why? The longest of the lines run straight as an arrow for miles, so some believe it would have acted as a landing strip. Perhaps the art was meant to be gifts of appreciation to the aliens so they may look down at them from above. So how did the ancients manage to create such a precise etchings from the ground without being able to fly? The only theoretical way is that people could have flown in the air at this time is with the form of a hot air balloon, as suggested by American explorer Jim Woodman. But we don't know for sure, so the NASA Nazca lines uh, remain a fascinating enigma, but the explanation for how the Nazca lines were physically created is quite simple. They're called geoglyphs. These enigmatic designs are made by removing the top rust colored layer of rocks and exposing the bright white sand underneath. And for number one, let's investigate the Sardinian giant. The Mediterranean's most important archaeological discovery of the 20th century was a complete accident and also unearthed a creepy conspiracy. When farmers are plowing their fields in 1974 in central Cabras, they hit something. That something turned out to be 5,000 fragments that underwent a painstaking and lengthy reconstruction process to form gigantic statues. 16 boxers, 6 archers, and 6 warriors, this colossal army of 26 statues has a height of 8 feet 2 inches and weigh an average of 880 pounds each. Each figure was carved from one limestone block alone. They have highly stylized features such as triangular faces, T-shaped eyebrows and noses, and their most distinctive features are their eyes. They're represented by large round circles that stare straight right ahead and right into your soul. I imagine if they weren't built to be intimidating, they were anyways. Every photo I've seen feels like they see through you. This is one of the aspects that give the statues an alien look, fueling alternative theories about the ancient astronauts. What is certain is that the giants are surrounded by an aura of legend since their discovery, as they belong to the mysterious Nuragiyak civilization, which very little is known of. The lands of Sardinia are also dotted with their tombs, which are called tombs of giants. Why? Because they're huge! The burial chambers are 65 to 98 feet in length and 7 to 10 feet deep and according to the various inhabitants of nearby cities, very large bones were found in the countryside surrounding their village. Some claim that they belong to men up to 11 feet tall. Legendary painter Muscus himself found the remains of a giant skeleton in a cave in 1972 when he was still a child and made one of these claims himself. Interviewed repeatedly by journalists, locals stand by that any giant skeletons that have shown up or been shown to authorities or the experts when they are found almost always disappear appeared into thin air the next day. Sometimes so did the finder. Yeah. 